Christian Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents Don't Lose Heart, Gospel Hope for the Discouraged Soul by Jason Meyer Narrated by Adam Werner Introduction Why Discouragement is a Liar The Bible includes some stories that seem downright strange. Have you ever read something in Scripture and wondered how on earth it applies to our lives today? The Old Testament book of 2 Kings contains a story so archaic, it seems unlikely that we could relate to it nowadays. At the time the story took place, the nation of Syria was warring against Israel. Every time the king of Syria planned an attack, Israel's king would somehow find out about his plans and thwart them. Exasperated, the Syrian king declared there must have been a spy in his ranks and demanded to know who it was. His servant informed him that there was indeed a spy, but he wasn't from Syria. Instead, the informant was the prophet Elisha, who had been receiving visions of the king's secret plans directly from God, and then relaying that information to Israel's king. As you can imagine, the king of Syria did not take the news well. One morning, as the prophet Elisha and his servant got up, they encountered a very troubling situation. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Second Kings chapter 6 verse 15 Elisha and his servant were going about their regular daily lives, when suddenly they were surrounded by one of the greatest armies in the ancient world, the Syrian army. The imbalance of the situation seems almost comical. What were two people against an entire army? When Elisha's servant looked at the Syrian chariots and horses surrounding him, he cried out in despair at their seemingly hopeless scenario. As we read this story, it's easy to think, that's interesting enough, but what is the application for me today? I don't have a hostile army forming a siege circle around my home. You and I may not be staring down an enemy force from a foreign country, but we do face seemingly hopeless circumstances every day. In Second Kings chapter 6, the dynamics of discouragement are almost perfectly on display. Like Elisha and his servant, we sometimes find ourselves surrounded by difficulties, and that is when the servant's question becomes our question. What shall we do? We share the same problem. We are blind to the big picture. The Danger of Discouragement Discouragement is a liar, and the danger is that sometimes these lies are hard to spot because of their sophisticated packaging. The distorted lies of discouragement come to us like a wolf in sheep's clothing. They are clothed in half-truths because they only get part of the picture right. Here is where the story of Elisha's servant and the Syrian army makes its most powerful point. The servant was right about the reasons to lose heart. There was an army of reasons to be discouraged, literally. But the servant saw only half the story. Elisha told his despondent servant to look at their circumstances again. He needed to be confronted with the full truth, so he wouldn't be discouraged by the half-truth. Elisha told him, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16-17 through 17. Discouragement can be defeated only when the full truth of everything that is for us confronts and conquers the half-truth of fear and despair. When the full truth vanquishes those half-truths, our hearts will be comforted and strengthened. In other words, we can take heart. This is the way the Bible speaks of discouragement again and again and again. It does not pretend that the problems are not there. It simply declares that there is more to see. The Christian life is a fight for sight. If all we see is what is against us, the shackles of discouragement will keep us confined to a prison of despair. When we see that the one who is for us is greater than all that is against us, our chains will fall off and our hearts will be free to hope again. 
Losing heart is easy when the chains of discouragement close tightly around our hearts and choke our hope. But we can take heart when the chains are gone and our hearts set free once again. Seeing the bigger picture is the key to unlocking the chains of despair. The Dynamic of Discouragement We lose heart when we believe half-truths because they remind us that there are real reasons to become discouraged. Those troubling facts feel compelling when they stand on their own, and it is easy to become overwhelmed by discouragement because the reasons are real. I have bad news and good news to share. The bad news is that our fallen world is full of many reasons to lose heart, and they are easy to see. It does not take any special skill to recognize the reasons in our everyday lives. It does not take faith to become discouraged. We just have to take a look at some of the problems that plague us. Discouragement is a heaviness of heart that comes from feeling the weight of those problems piling up on us. But here is the good news. The reasons to take heart are greater than the reasons to lose heart. In other words, we can defeat discouragement because it is only a half-truth. Encouragement does not come from wishful thinking, but from seeing the totality of truth and embracing what is truly real. Let's go back to the story of Elisha and his servant. When they were surrounded by enemies, Elisha said, Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16 In the same way, encouragement comes when we are convinced that the reasons to take heart are greater than the reasons to lose heart. When we recognize that these reasons are superior, we can take up the biblical battle cry of hope. We do not lose heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 Now I have more bad news. Not only are the reasons to lose heart easy to see, but the reasons to take heart are harder to see. Vanquishing discouragement is never automatic, nor easy. It is a hard-fought fight for sight. But why is it hard? Like Elisha's servant, we are often painfully aware of what is against us, but woefully unaware of all that is for us. Even though the reasons to take heart are greater than the reasons to lose heart, the former can often only be seen by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 This is where good news comes back into the picture. The reasons to take heart are actually more real than the reasons to lose heart. Now I know that it usually feels the opposite because the things that are physically visible can feel more solid or substantial than the promises of God. But the Bible contradicts that half-truth with this full truth. The things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 The things we tangibly see are temporary. The things we cannot see, eternal things, are ultimately more solid and substantial and lasting. The bottom line in the fight for sight is this. We lose heart when we lose sight of all that we have in Jesus. When we lose sight of Jesus, we see only half the picture. We believe half truths, and we are robbed of hope. But as believers, we are called to fight back. If we belong to Christ, how can we lose our hope? Christ in us is the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. The fallen world we live in has many reasons to lose heart. But Jesus says to you and to me, Take heart, I have overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33. Dealing with Discouragement In this book, we will look at the issue of discouragement theologically and practically. The problem with many practical theology books is that they are not always practical or theological. This book aims to be both. In the chapters that follow, we will begin by looking at a big picture of God, and then we will look at how that vision affects the practical details of everyday life. The chapters are short and to the point, because a long book on discouragement would be discouraging. Part one of this book is like an eye exam. Do you see the greatness of God? Do you see all that you have in Him? If God is for you, then what could stand against you? And in part two, we will dig a little deeper by analyzing some of the real-life reasons that we tend to lose heart. 
We will examine the past, present, and future problems posed by discouragement and discover biblical reasons to take heart. The conclusion is a stirring reminder of a central theological truth. God is not done. Before we begin, there are two crucial points of context to understand before beginning to read this book. First, please do not think of discouragement only in individual terms. We are not meant to try to defeat discouragement on our own. I am convinced that we sometimes read verses like Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 the wrong way. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What enters into your mind when you read this verse? Too often, we picture running a race all by ourselves. It is easy to understand why. No one can run for us. This truth also applies to the Christian life. Each of us must run our own race. But this way of reading the text misses the full truth. None of us runs alone. You and I share in a massive community of believers called the Communion of Saints. We can look around at the godly men and women who have finished the race and are now cheering us on and reminding us that God is faithful. We can also turn to our left and our right to see our brothers and sisters in Christ running along beside us. There is strength in numbers. Do not try to fight discouragement on your own. I will never forget an inspiring story I read about the Hannah High cross-country team in Anderson, South Carolina. The people in the stands would come to support their children, but they would cheer the loudest for the runner who always finished last. That student, Ben Komen, had cerebral palsy. Ben's condition caused him to fall constantly because he did not lift his feet high enough when he ran. He tripped on everything and fell hard because his brain could not send signals fast enough to get his arms underneath him to cushion the fall. After every race, Ben ended up bruised and bloodied, but he never quit. He always finished last, but he always finished. Grown men would break down and weep while watching this display of perseverance. Ben's teammates would go back out on the course to run the last ten minutes of the race with him. The girls' team would also join, and sometimes runners from opposing teams would go back and run with him as well. They would finish the race together. That is a great picture of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 in action. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Most of our races will not be like a cross-country challenge. The typical life is more like a tough mutter with obstacles all around us. Razor wire, mud, freezing water, electric lines, and obstacles within. Mental and physical fatigue. Life throws similar challenges at us. Unexpected medical bills, extended family drama, loss of a job, etc., but the race of life doesn't last forever, and the stakes are much, much higher. Do not attempt to fight this battle against discouragement alone. Find the most Bible-believing, grace-soaked, Christ-exalting church you can. Put yourself on the path of grace, where you will hear the word of Christ, and link arms with others who will run the race with you. The picture of Hebrews chapter 12 fits with the popular African proverb that says, If you want to go fast... Go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Let's fight together, run together, and finish together. Now let me say a word to those of you who are coming to this book with deep wounds. Perhaps you are trying to fight the good fight and run the race with deep-seated trauma, brokenness, or depression. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Though you desperately try to combat discouragement by filling your mind with biblical truth, you still find that anxiety, panic, and fear constantly threaten to hijack your brain and body in ways that seem to override anything you believe in your heart to be true. If this describes your daily reality, then you may feel as if I'm asking you to run a marathon with a broken leg or climb a flight of stairs in a wheelchair. The last thing I want is for you to feel condemned because you cannot run the race as fast as someone else. There is no shame in using crutches if you have a broken leg, and wheelchair ramps are a wonderful gift from God. I believe that God has provided good gifts, such as medication and God-honoring, clinically informed, 
gospel-saturated counseling for those who run the race of faith with conditions that seem to make everything harder. As you read the biblical truths in this book, please do not forget the truth that Jesus is our gentle Savior. He would never break or despise a bruised reed. Matthew chapter 12, verse 20. This book is not a simplistic replacement for the specialized kinds of professional help that address the complexities of pain and trauma and deep darkness. I am not a medical doctor and do not have expertise in counseling people who are clinically depressed or suffer from considerable trauma. However, even if you are walking through deep darkness, this book can still provide crucial biblical help. Many Christians will attest that becoming a Christian does not mean that their struggle with depression comes to an end, but it does change some of the dynamics of the struggle. Before coming to Christ, depression can feel like a bottomless pit, a free fall into a dark abyss with no end in sight. After becoming a Christian, depression may still feel like being plunged into darkness, but there is something underneath the darkness, solid ground to stand on. This book is not designed to treat depression, but my prayer is that it can provide something solid for you to stand on when you feel discouraged and struggle in the dark places. This book is a call to take the sword of truth and the shield of faith and stand against the sophisticated half-truths of discouragement.